Thanks, Craig. Um, uh, thanks, everyone. A really great set of papers so far. I'm really particular. I've enjoyed the discussion. I'm a little disappointed in all the people who presented so far, as they seem to have offered well-rounded, well-thought-through, <laughs> properly constructed arguments, and have totally abandoned the noble tag tradition of throwing your presentation together at the last minute, wondering what the hell your abstract was about anyway, and trying to cobble something together as your eyes fall with, shut with sleep at the end of a long term. Don't worry, I'm going to uphold that tradition in what follows. So finally, <laughs> someone will represent tag as it ought to be, at least in my view. Uh, that's basically just a massive excuse, obviously. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Um, so in my paper today, I want to tease apart some of the issues arising from how we discuss relations in archaeology. As Craig and I argued in our recent book, a decent proportion of the major recent developments in archaeological theory could broadly be characterised as relational whether it's a Latourian emphasis that things only exist to the extent they affect something else, a Deleuzean discussion of assemblages, an emphasis on perspectivism, or a Baradian discussion of phenomena, all of these are relational approaches. That is to say, they emphasise how things emerge in the world through relations and affect the world through relations. Their shared relational quality is what allows them to be combined in interesting ways. Chris Fowler's 2013 book is a good example of this. It's on the screen uh, behind me. But also it allows them to be conflated in unfortunate ways, where sometimes their differences and subtleties get suppressed. The relational turn has not been without its critics, both those who are sympathetic overall and those who advocate a, um, a move away from a reliance on relations. The latter is a view usually rooted in object-orientated ontology. In my paper today, I'm not going to try and review all the different kinds of relational archaeology that currently exist, though I'm sure if pressed in questions, I could point you in the direction of a very reasonably prized Christmas present, appropriate book that you can buy, and yeah, absolutely, you know, order on Amazon now, available in all good bookshops, give it to your friends and family, it will go down a tree, honestly. Craig's made his daughter read it. It's, uh, it's, uh... Anyway, what I am going to do is try and do three things other than plug my book, so four things, three things. Our For, book. Our book. Our book. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. <laughs> First, I'm going to briefly discuss the recent reaction against relations and try and swiftly dispose of that line, dispose of, that line of attack to emphasise why I think a relational approach may, remains central. Second, I want to outline some of the internal critique that scholars have identified. Third, I want to sketch out how we can address some of these issues by developing a description of relations based on in the philosophy of Gilles Deleuze, or Giles Deleuze as Craig called him this morning, uh, drawing connections to other ideas, particularly to some of the terms of Charles Sanders Peirce that we just heard Zoe speaking about so eloquently. To do so, I hope to offer an outline of what a move from a more generalised relational ontology to a more specifically Deleuzean one might begin to look like. So not much to get through in the next 15 minutes or so. So part one, are relations all they're cracked up to be? First, I want to respond then to this idea that relations are not all the be-all and end-all of things. One of the most notable lines of attack on relational thinking has come, perhaps surprisingly, from symmetrical archaeology. I say surprisingly because in its early days, symmetrical archaeology was clearly a relational approach, as Craig and I noted in our introduction to the session. However, Whitmore and Olson in particular have now become critical of this reliance on relations. Specifically, they suggest that early symmetrical archaeology placed, quote, sorry, quote, placed more emphasis on the assemblages and entanglements than on the autonomy and integrity of things, end quote. This criticism can be traced back to Olson's earlier arguments in his book, Defense of Things, in Defense of Things, where he suggests that we have now reached the limits of where relational thinking can take us. This critique of relations draws primarily on ideas taken from object-orientated ontology, or triple O, and in particular the work of Graham Harmon. Harman has been a vocal critic of relational approaches for some time, despite his deep admiration for Bruno Latour. He accuses relational thinkers of variously undermining, that is, reducing objects to their constituent relations, overmining, presuming objects only exist in as much as they relate to other things, or worst of all, duo-mining, doing both at the same time, the evil sin of duo-mining. In all three cases, Harman argues that relational approaches leave no space for objects themselves, and that we need to recognise that objects have a, quote, withdrawn essence, and Zoe was making reference to this again in the previous paper. However, if you're actually interested in engaging with the past in writing history, it's quite difficult to understand how one squares this with such an essence. How do such essences emerge historically? At what point does the essence of the pot you're carefully shaping with your hands come to abide in the vessel? Harman's own attempt to write history, his historical account of the uh, Dutch East India Company in his book Immaterialism, 
actually deals much more with specific forms of relations, well, your symbiotic relations, than it does with essences. In turn, it is this reliance on essences, I would say, that forms the reason behind a second wave of symmetrical archaeology, has produced a second wave of symmetrical archaeology, its triple O turn, if you like, that is resolutely anti-historical. Arguing from this perspective, Olson says we need to escape, and I quote here again, the imperative of history, end quote. And so he's more interested about writing ruins as ruins or driftwood as driftwood than explaining the historical processes through which these things came into existence. So if you do want to describe the emergence of specific historical phenomena, even if you want to do so in a non-anthropocentric manner that gives things their due, I'm not sure this critique of relations has much to offer us. Fundamentally, critiquing relational approaches for ignoring things themselves is all very well, but replacing the centrality of relations with a notion of essence prevents us from explaining history and explaining emergence, a point that Chris Fowler and I have explored at length elsewhere. So I think a more pertinent line of attack, and one I think in need of a considered response, has been what we might think of as an internal critique. So in this vein, Darrell Wilkinson has developed the argument that if we take the whole world as relationally constituted, a la a Barad or a Latour, then discussing personhood, for example, as being more or less relational makes little sense. Chris Fowler, the doyen of rational, <laughs> relational personhood, has acknowledged this. And in his 2016 response, he begins to analyse the multiple ways in which personhood emerges relationally. Chris's acknowledgement that, to quote again from Chris this time, Chris Fowler, personhood is always relational, but the relationships involved vary qualitatively in nature and strength, end quote, is a critical step in the right direction. And if I had more time, I'd analyse that in more depth. <coughs> in parallel, Astrid Van Oyen has emphasised that simply stating that things are relational may be true, but it is only trivially true, as she puts it. Van Oyen sets out to define what she calls relational constellations, which are ways of thinking about how sets of relations are ordered. In a comparable manner to Fowler, Van Oyen recognises Strathern's dividuals as one particular relational constellation, and then goes to seek others. She defines three different relational constellations based on the production and exchange and use of three different types of Roman pottery. Like Fowler's, this approach has much to, much to recommend it and deserves far greater interrogation than I can offer in a short tag paper. One point I would make about both approaches, though, is that modes of personhood on the one hand and constellations of relations on the other tend to work at specific scales. They may be emergent to differing extents, but they tend to focus around specific elements of the world, people on the one hand, pottery on the other. These offer useful examples, therefore, but they don't furnish us with a fundamental philosophical approach, although we should acknowledge that both authors have done that elsewhere, Chris taking broadly new materialist approaches and Astrid taking a broadly uh, actor network theory influenced one. What I think both of these scholars get right, however, is that we need to become much more sophisticated in how we talk about relations. Thus, what I want to attempt to do here is to begin to define other ways of exploring relations, of identifying, following, attending to, and mapping them. I suggest we can do this by thinking through the ph philosophy of Gilles Deleuze. In what follows, I'm not going to give neatly worked archaeological examples or simple characterizations or describe Deleuze's philosophy in any depth. My aim here is simply to begin a line of thought, or what Deleuze and Guattari would call a line of flight, and see where it takes me here and in the years to come. I want to start, also want to start the process of connecting these ideas to those from other theoretical approaches, and in particular to some of the terms from Charles Sanders Peirce that Zoe's just been talking about, and that Deleuze and Guattari draw explicitly upon in A Thousand Plateaus. To begin this process, I want to outline and develop three broad conceptual claims about relations that I argue can form the first step in developing tools for their characterizations. The first claim I want to make is that relations are intensive as well as extensive. The second is that intensity is what allows relations to endure. The third is that relations work through difference. I'm going to examine each of those in turn and hopefully unpack them a bit now. When we approach relations in archaeology, we are familiar with the way they work extensively. That is how we trace them extending through space and time, particularly through space. This, after all, is the basic function of network analysis, which works through linking elements across different sites. This is a world of length and width and depth and distance and chronological time. Each of these is important, but each is only one element of how relations work. This is because relations are also intensive. That is, they work through relations of force, the way in which bodies press into one another, in other words. 
The intensive captures energy present and waiting to be released, the heat waiting to emerge from a log when you throw it on the fire, the wave of emotions that crash over you at the death of a loved one. These elements of relations cannot be divided in the way that extensive elements can. You can't feel half an emotion, but they can be mapped, experienced and described. One word for thinking through the world in this way is affect, a tool for describing these intensities and their variety and range. Affects are not anthropocentric. We can think of affective relations between non-humans of all sorts. And of course, uh, Deleuze Guattari used von Exel's tick, tick in the same way to talk about a tick's affect in A Thousand Plateaus. We can think about how these affective relations then stretch out and reach out into the world through and between humans, non-humans, and all the things with which we share our lives. I wonder if another term for thinking through intensive relations is one of the ones we've just heard Zoe talk about, Peirce's term, the index. As we've already heard, an index is a type of sign relation for Peirce, where there is some form of connection between two elements. So a flag fluttering is indexical of the wind blowing, or smoke billowing is indexical of the presence of fire. In both cases, though, the index in this context captures an intensive, energetic relation, one which can vary depending on how much smoke there is, telling you about the intensity of the fire, or how fast the flag is fluttering, telling you about the strength, the intensity of the wind. Indexes, in this case, are non-arbitrary precisely because of the intensity of their connections. The intensity connects the sign and the signified, or territorialises them, in Deleuze and Guattari's terms, brings them together. My second conceptual claim is that intensity allows relations to endure. From the nuclear synthesis of atoms and stars via the folding processes that forge geological strata to the physical effort in constructing prehistoric monuments that guide and limit movement, constructing relations that last requires energy and intensity. For Deleuze and Guattari, we can think about how firmly linked and bounded elements of the world become stratified, it's their term, such that their relations cannot be easily changed or severed. This is important. Too often, relational approaches can be reduced to ever-shifting webs that seem to alter at the slightest touch, most notably in the work of Latour, of course, where any change to the network creates an entirely new network. Instead, embracing the manner in which intensity creates and sustains ties that are hard to sever allows us to think, on, think of how some relations endure over the long term, whilst others remain less firmly enmeshed, only contingently obligatory, as Manuel de Landa puts it. Here we, might want to we may want to contrast the more long-lasting Deleuzean notion of strata with the shifting links associated with the territorialization of assemblages. In the latter case, connections come and go, shifting and becoming more rapidly than the slowly moving strata. Critical of, course is, critical, of course, however, is that we do not confuse any distinction between stratification and territorialization as a contrast between nature and culture. Throughout the organic and geological world, we can trace the emergence of short-term assemblages that are only weakly territorialized. For example, in Deleuze's, Deleuze and Guattari's famous example of the wasp and the orchid. And in the worlds of human beings, we can identify long-term, highly stratified relations that endure. These run from the habits that become part of all of us to the assemblages that create particular way of doing things over the very long term. We might think of how Christian notions of dualisms, representation and absolute truth underlie many Western assumptions about the world and how it works today, even for atheists. Or we might think about how connections and understandings of gender can be traced from the Bronze Age through to the present day. These are no less historically situated and no less relational for their endurance, and it is through their ongoing intensity, the effort and energy expended in their production and critically in their reproduction that they endure. The notion of habit allows us to think about how relations can work representationally and connect us to Peirce's idea of the symbol. And here, going back to what Craig said this morning, I think we want to be more than representation. We don't want to throw representation out. We want to think about how it's one part of the world, at least in the way I want to approach post-humanism. For in a symbol, a particular sign and signifier come to be linked through history and habit, say the fact that green means go, rather than through intensive relations uh, direct, linked directly, as in the case of the index that we saw above. For Deleuze and Guattari, Peirce's symbol captures a relative deterritorialization, as they put it, and what they mean by that is how one thing comes to stand for another. However, it's intensive relations that can ensure this connection endures, becomes re-territorialized, becomes bring, brought back together, or even stratified, that is kind of bound up permanently, or very, not quite permanently, but for a very long time, over, over a long duration. My final conceptual declaration is that relations work through difference. Now, in some ways, this might have been the claim to start with because it underlies the others I'm making here and forms the ontological basis for any Deleuzean perspective on the world. 
Relations, as we standardly think of them, work on the basis of similarity. We tend to look at two people who appear similar and think, oh, they must be related. Or we look at people dressed the same, say wearing the kit of the same sports team, and say, oh, they must have something in common. This is a way of thinking rooted in a logic of identity, where difference is about the presence or absence of similarity. Two people wearing different football shirts are in some way, are the same in some ways, they're football fans, but they lack the similarity between their football shirts, and, or rather, sorry, the lack of similarity between their football shirts shows how different they are to each other. They support different teams. Difference here is negative and rooted in representation, but what would a positive di version of difference look like? Here difference becomes a productive force, something that has a central role in the emergence of relations, and so the emergence of the world through differentiation. Here what links our football fans is not the presence or absence of similarity, are the tops they wear the same, but rather the way in which they emerge through a repeated process of individuation and differentiation from a world of potentials, which team will I support, to one where that decision is made and repeated through intensive engagements. Like any relations we have seen, your fandom endures because of the ongoing intensity required to sustain itself through repetition. Such an approach allows us to open up new ways of tracing relatedness, say between archaeological monuments. Rather than presuming that Neolithic long barrows are related because of their shared final form, as we have typically done, a moment of typological and representational logic, a relation of identity, we can instead think about how they share, what they share are processes of differentiation, the manner through which they emerge in the world relationally by being differentiated against a backdrop of other potentials, this load of soil being dumped here and not there, these bodies piling up rock in this order and not that. Here differentiation is the process through which spec the specificity, the thisness of the world emerges, a force which drives and creates the relations, first of intensity, then of extension. This specificity, this particularity, is what both Peirce and Deleuze and Guattari would call a hakaiety, or hakaiety, or however you pronounce that word. <laughs> but this, oh, I, I genuinely don't know. But this also allows us to rethink not only difference, but also repetition. What is repeated here each time in different ways is the process of differentiation, it's difference that's being repeated, the particular way in which a set of potentials become actualised in the world. Each time a long barrel was built, it was not only the outcome of an underlying design, but a repetition of difference. Thus, the final f it's not the final form that truly links long barrows, but a virtual structure, meaning virtual in the sense that Gavin Lucas was discussing in the plenary uh, on Monday. This virtual structure is what Deleuze would call a diagram, a term he originally took from Peirce. Their final form, which shares a visual or iconic relationship, allows us to re-territorialise these monuments into a single group, recovering from their hecaities, hecaities, their thisness, the repetitive processes through which they emerged. In this paper, then, I've argued we need to move beyond a straightforward attribution of relations, that the world is relational is true, as, as I would argue, but as Von Arjen would put it, it, that's only trivially so. To begin this process, I've made three conceptual claims that I think can begin to shift us in the way we talk about, describe and engage with relations. These are that relations are intensive as well as extensive, that intensity, it is intensity that allows relations to endure, and that relations work through difference. I've also suggested that each of these linked ideas beyond Deleuzean philosophy, notably in this case the work of Peirce, but I could have made further links again to other forms of new materialism, in some ways to animist ontologies, or even to various forms of object-orientated ontology, and teasing out those similarities and differences is one of the things that Craig and I spent some time thinking about. As archaeology begins to interrogate what it means to be relational, what is clear to me is that we need to develop new ways of discussing how different relations emerge in different historical contexts. This can involve descriptive terminologies, which we might suggest could include Fowler's discussion of personhood, Peirce's signs and Van Oyen's relational constellations. It will also require us to interrogate what the philosophical and analytical basis is through which that we can begin to differentiate between relations. And it's this process that I've begun to try to outline today. Thanks very much indeed.